Well, good morning, everyone. How are you? Good. Hey, I'll tell you a little secret. You guys sing way louder than a 915. Way. <laughs> it wasn't even close. That's fantastic. I don't know if it's coffee, donuts, what it is, or you're just passionate. I think it's just you're passionate, which is awesome. That's one of the things I, I love coming back here to see is just um, this many people worshiping in one spot. As Chelsea mentioned, my name is Paul Jenkinson, and I'm the campus pastor out at our Milford location. But I was the worship pastor here for almost 15 years, and so I just, I love, yeah. So I just love, I love coming back and singing and getting drowned out by you guys in the seats. That's just fantastic. Well, Bob and Shirley are away this weekend. Bob called me about, I don't know, eight weeks ago or so. He said, hey, I'm going to be gone. Do you want to come over and speak on the book of Habakkuk? And I said, yeah, this is usually when you call, when there's a really difficult book of the Bible. No, I said, yeah, I would love to come over because I actually love this little book. It's my favorite book in the Old Testament, and Bob knew that, and so I think that's why he asked me. I know that you've been in the prophets. You've been in the big prophets. You've been in Isaiah, and you've been in Jeremiah. And today, you're going to get a chance to spend some time in a little prophet. But I'm going to warn you right at the beginning, this little prophet is going to have a big message for you. All of God's word works together to give us a picture of what God's like and a picture of what we're like and how relationship with him works. And so in that way, Habakkuk, even though he's a guy with kind of an odd name in a part of the Bible that uh, we don't read all that much, the minor prophets, his message is going to be very modern and very relevant for you today. I think that's what you're going to find. For example, try these questions on for size. Have you ever seen or been the victim of injustice? Yes, you have. I have. Have you ever suffered or watched suffering and then just wish that suffering would just go away? Yes. Have you ever watched what you would consider to be a bad person, just continue to prosper and succeed and wonder, why in the world does it get, why do they get away with that? Yes, you have. How about these questions that are a little more aimed right at God? Have you ever been talking to God and felt like your prayers are just bouncing off the ceiling? Yes. Have you ever heard God say something in his word and wondered, why in the world would you say that, God? Yes. And lastly, have you ever asked God, what's taking you so long? <laughs> why are you so slow, God? When are you going to show up? Well, welcome to Habakkuk's party, is what he would say, because he thinks, he feels, he asks all of those questions. And his conversations with God are captured in this little book as a gift to us. Because what we find when we read the words in this little prophetic book is that very often the words that Habakkuk has for God are the same words that we have for God. And very often the words that we hear God say back to Habakkuk, those are God's words back to us. That's how scripture works. Now, over all these words that you're going to hear in Habakkuk today, and you're going to hear a lot, we're going to read quite a bit, we're going to traverse the whole book. It is a short book. It's only three chapters. We're going to look at the whole picture, because you need the whole picture to get really the whole message that Habakkuk wants you to have. Over all those words, there's going to be one word that's going to stand above all of them and give you the context, really, to absorb all of them. And that one word is this, vision, vision. That's the word. So keep that in your mind, the word vision. Let me show you what I mean as we begin with the opening paragraph. The prophecy that Habakkuk the prophet received. How long, Lord, must I call for help, but you do not listen? Or cry out to you, violence, but you do not save. Why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrongdoing? Destruction and violence are before me. There is strife and conflict abounds. Therefore, the law is paralyzed and justice never prevails. The wicked hem in the righteous, 
so that justice is perverted. So far in the prophets, you've been getting a a pretty good dose of what the spiritual condition of God's people is like, and it's not been very good, has it? But Habakkuk here gives you just a really condensed dose of it, and it's very graphic the way that Habakkuk describes his landscape. He says in six words, violence, injustice, wrongdoing, destruction, strife, and conflict. Now, the ironic thing is that God's people were supposed to be shining examples of what the opposite of that looked like. They were supposed to have connection with God in their own hearts, and as a result, that was supposed to dominate their societal landscape as well. It wasn't supposed to look like this, but it does. And Habakkuk gives us the answer. He says, there's one main reason why I look out at my town, at my landscape, and these six things are what I see. There's, there's one main reason. And he tells us what it is. He says, the law is paralyzed. And when Habakkuk says the law, this is the word Torah. It's just a word meaning all of God's words. So all the words that God has spoken to his people, that's the law. What he's like, what they're like, what they're supposed to live like, to prosper with God, all, those are God's words. That's the Torah. He says the law, God's words, are paralyzed. And behind that word paralyzed is a really graphic little Hebrew word, which means to grow weary or to grow cold. So Habakkuk is describing his culture, his people, and he says, what's been happening is, is my people have been taking God's words to them, and instead of letting them come into their heart and mind, they've been taking them and putting them in the freezer. <laughs> They're frozen like a block of ice. They have no impact <laughs> on God's people anymore. And there's a consequence of that, and Habakkuk says, as a result, justice never prevails, but rather is perverted. That's what's happening. Now, let me ask you a question. Is that an ancient problem, or is that a modern problem? <laughs> yes, is the answer. Habakkuk is struggling <laughs> in his culture with these things. They have their unique things about their culture. We have our unique things about our culture, but we share this general trend. And we could come up with our own six words to describe our landscape, couldn't we? How about just three things? What about the climate of sexual harassment that just seems to dominate the headlines? You know, I was driving here last night for the Saturday night service, and um, just before I, I looked at my phone and I saw in the NPR news feed yet another story of this. It just seems like it's everywhere. You know why? Because we as a culture, we have ignored God's words on personhood and sexuality. <laughs> That's why we have that. What about the caustic state of our political landscape? Well, the reason it's like that in our culture is because we've ignored God's words to us on leadership and citizenship. What about our work environments where so many of us are in jobs where we're expected to work not 40, not 50, 60, 70, 80 hours a week, be accessible 24 seven if we wanna keep our jobs. Tremendous pressure. You know why that is the way that it is in our culture? Because as a culture, we've ignored God's words on work and rest. <laughs> and we could make a longer list than that. Habakkuk could have too. He's suffering under this injustice. And so he cries out to God. He says, I call for help, <laughs> but you don't listen. I cry out, God, but you do not save. Habakkuk is wondering where God is in the midst of his own suffering. And you probably wonder that too at times, don't you? What does God do? He does respond to Habakkuk. He answers him, and his answer very much surprises Habakkuk, just like it often surprises us. God says to Habakkuk, Habakkuk, look and be amazed. Let's read on. Look at the nations and watch and be utterly amazed. For I'm going to do something in your days that you would not believe, even if you were told. 
I'm raising up the Babylonians, that ruthless and impetuous people who sweep across the whole earth to seize dwellings not their own. They're a feared and dreaded people. They're a law to themselves, promote their own honor. Their horses are swifter than leopards, fiercer than wolves. Their cavalry gallops headlong. Their horsemen come from afar. They fly like an eagle swooping to devour. They all come intent on violence. Their hordes advance like a desert wind and gather prisoners like sand. They mock kings and scoff at rulers. They laugh at fortified cities. By building earthen ramps, they capture them, and then they sweep past like the wind and go on. Guilty people whose own strength is their God. That's not the kind of amazement Habakkuk was looking to be amazed with <laughs> when he's asking God, God, help us. <laughs> God says, look and be amazed, Habakkuk. He says, I'm raising up the Babylonians. These guys are the worst, the worst. And I, I know you've been in the prophets, so I know you've been learning things about this ancient history of Israel and how they were divided up into 12 tribes and then 10 were designated in the north and two in the south. They had a divided kingdom, right? And the 10 tribes in the north were worse. Habakkuk's list would have been longer <clears throat> if he was describing the north. And so as a result, um, God sent corrective measures to them earlier than he did to the southern two tribes. And so the, the, the nation before Babylon came on the scene, the Assyrian emperor, they came in and they, they conquered the 10 northern tribes and they sent them away into captivity. So now it's just the two in the south left and that's where Habakkuk lives right around 600 BC. He lives and writes these words. And God says, I'm raising up the new kid on the block. I'm raising up the Babylonian empire. They come from this part of the world, modern day Iraq, Iran area. And that red blob is just gonna keep blobbing <laughs> over that whole area. And what they bring is not good. God describes them in these graphic terms, ruthless, impetuous, fearsome, dreaded, fast, fierce, devouring, doing violence, taking prisoners. You know what's interesting? In God's description of the Babylonians, you see the same two themes emerge in Habakkuk's description of his own people. You see the theme of injustice and violence characterizing both peoples. Now, what's, why is that? Why, why is the narrative captured this way where these two themes emerge and then they emerge again? This is why. God is telling Habakkuk, Habakkuk, this is, this is why this is going to happen. Since my people will not have my justice, my good and benevolent and merciful fair, life-giving justice. They won't have that, so they will have the Babylonians' justice. And since my people have chosen violence to typify their culture and their society, they will now have the Babylonians' violence. This answer, it does amaze Habakkuk. It puts him back on his heels because he's asking God to take care of the problem and God tells him, Habakkuk, your people are a major part of the problem. They do violence, they do injustice because they have it in here. <laughs> and I need to send corrective measures because I've been talking, I've been talking for a long time and all my people have done have taken my words and stuck them in the freezer. I've given them these delightful words <laughs> He said, oh, wait, we don't want to eat that. We'll eat that later, maybe. We'll stick it in the freezer. God says, okay, you don't want to eat those words? Now you're going to eat these. Corrective measure God brings. Let me ask you, is that an ancient response on God's part, or is that a modern response? It's both. Yes. Here's a truism as well. This one's a little uncomfortable for us to hear, but it is true. For God's people, it's true. Where God's words are ignored, God can and will use every measure as part of his corrective purposes. The prophets that you've been reading about, they've been warning profusely, haven't they? All these prophets, they all are a part of the same club, and if they all got together on one day, 
And we came to them and we said, hey, we want to we wanna get you guys a uniform. We want you guys to have a T-shirt. We want you to pick a word to put on your T-shirt for kind of your club. What word do you guys want to pick? You know what? It would take them like two seconds to come up with that word. They would all agree. The word would be return. <laughs> return. Because that's the job of a prophet is to speak God's words to God's people, telling them, return to me. <laughs> You've wandered away. Return to me. And God's people have been feeling a sense of security, but it's false security because they, they wa they've watched and saw how God has moved out other nations so that they could come into this land. And very often so, these other nations were worse, you know, morally than God's people. And so they look at these nations, oh yeah, that happens to those guys. That's what God does to those other nations that are just wicked. And God, God says, you, you fail to realize that I'm no respecter of persons. Yes, you are my people, but you know why I chose you? Not because you were better than them. I chose you because I wanted to start something with you. You're supposed to be a society that honors me and hears my words, not sticks them in the freezer. And so you have personal transformation and then your society starts to transform and you're supposed to look like me and life comes out of you. That was supposed to be for you, but not just for you. You guys have missed the point. You were supposed to be a conduit for this to go to the nations around you as well because I love them just as much as I love you. <laughs> and God's people just got lost on the way and so God has to send these corrective measures. So Habakkuk's hearing this, and it does amaze him. And so he asks a second question to God. And the question is, how come? God, how come? Let's read on. Lord, are you not from everlasting? My God, my Holy One, you will never die. You, Lord, have appointed them to execute judgment. You, my rock, have, have ordained them to punish your eyes are too pure to look on evil. You cannot tolerate wrongdoing. Why then do you tolerate the treacherous? Why are you silent while the wicked swallow up those more righteous than themselves? You've made people like fish in the sea, like sea creatures that have no ruler. The wicked foe pulls all of them up with hooks. He catches them in his net. He gathers them up in his dragnet, and so he rejoices and is glad. Therefore, he sacrifices to his net and burns incense to his dragnet, for by his net he lives in luxury and enjoys the choicest food. Is he to keep on emptying his net, destroying nations without mercy? I will stand at my watch and station myself on the ramparts. I will look to see what he will say to me and what answer I am to give to this complaint. Habakkuk is trying to reconcile in his mind how God can do what he said he's about to do. And so he starts with God's character and he says, God, you're from everlasting. You're eternal. And you're also holy, morally pure, upright. And then he thinks of the Babylonian's character it's like, gosh, God, have you seen them? <laughs> They're terrible. They are the worst. How can you use them to judge us? We're your people. How come? Is this an ancient question? Is this a modern question? Yes. Have you ever been surprised at God when he does something? It seems just, gosh, Lord, how come you're allowing this to happen? Why are you doing this? It's a common experience for all of God's people. Sometimes God acts in ways that surprise us. <laughs> I probably should have said a lot of times, not sometimes. He just does. You know what God's like. He, he spends so much time in his word talking about his character and his intentions. And then, then you have that, and then you have just what seems to happen in your life and around you and in the world, and you're like, God, what gives? What gives? How can you, how can you kind of coexist, <laughs> commingle with all of this wickedness? 
Habakkuk, he's feeling this, he's wondering this. And it, it causes a, a problem for him because he had questions before, didn't he? He had the opening questions, which we already read. God, how come you're taking so long? Why do I talk, but you don't, you don't answer? And how come, God, you, you make my eyes just continually look on violence? And how come my suffering is lasting so long? Why? Hu human response, right? This is so human, so earthy. We can all relate to that. And now he's got other questions. He's like, okay, I I was sort of chalking that up, God, to just the common lot of man, maybe. But now, like, you, you're going to actually say, you actually just told me, God, that you're going you're to bring something in with your sovereign hand that's actually going to seem like it's going to increase my suffering and increase my eyes looking on evil. What gives with that, God? Habakkuk now has two alternatives. He's got a choice. He can either use his questions and his doubts to just turn from God and just, just walk away. He'd walk away just totally downcast, or he could walk away just ticked off with some choice words probably for God, right? You've been there. <laughs> I've been there. He could do that, and he could stay doing that. That's alternative number one. Or... Alternative number two is he could use his doubts and his suffering and his questions to push toward God and to honestly listen for God's answer to him in the midst of his adversary and his suffering. He chooses the latter, and this is what he says. He says, God, I will stand at my watch and station myself on the ramparts. I will look to see what he will say to me and what answer I'm to give to this complaint. This is huge. This is where the rubber is gonna meet the road for Habakkuk. It's where things are gonna get real. And either, either God is going to say something to him that he can hear and absorb and that will give context to his questions or the whole thing is gonna be over for our back. But he's made his choice. He says, I'm gonna stand, I'm gonna wait here, and I'm gonna watch, I'm gonna look, God. What's he doing? <laughs> he's digging in, isn't he? He's digging in. He says, I'm not gonna run, and I'm also not gonna belittle or just be totally fake about how I feel right now, about my questions. God, I got serious questions for you. Here they are. He digs in. How will God respond to that? Same way he always responds to his people when they choose to stand, ask an honest question and wait for an honest answer from God. God speaks, and God speaks, are you ready for it? In the one word that you can put over all the other words of this conversation between Habakkuk and God, he speaks vision. He speaks vision to Habakkuk. Then the Lord replied, write down the revelation and make it plain on tablets so that a herald may run with it. For the revelation, or the vision, awaits an appointed time. It speaks of the end and will not prove false. Though it linger, wait for it. It will certainly come and not delay. What's the vision or what's the revelation? It's a picture. It's a picture of the future. It's a picture of God's kingdom coming, his will being done on earth as it is in heaven. That's the picture that God gives to Habakkuk. He takes the better part of chapter 2 to give the details of the, this vision, but it has a very simple center. And so I just took one verse out of the whole chapter and I'll show it to you. Here's the center of the vision that God gives to Habakkuk. 
For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. The earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Habakkuk, there will be a day. It will come. It will not delay. (laughs) Wait for it. There will be a day when there will be no more injustice. There will be no more violence. And instead, my person, my presence, it will fill every space of this earth. It will fill every heart in this world. It will dispel every ounce of darkness. Every bit of suffering will be gone. Habakkuk, you will love it. It's coming. Wait for it. You hear this vision that God speaks to Habakkuk, and you realize, because you've been, you've been going through the whole Old Testament, you realize this is not the first time God has spoken this vision. This vision of his kingdom coming and his will being done, he's spoken it many times from the opening chapters of the Bible, and he continues to speak it all the way to the end of the Bible. Look at this in Revelation. God says, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Messiah, and he will reign forever and ever. If you were to condense the vision into one phrase, you might have something like this. In the end, the vision is that in the end, evil loses, God wins. Evil loses, and God wins wins. Isn't that interesting? Out of all the things God could have said to Habakkuk in the midst of intense adversity, intense suffering, and about to get more intense, God speaks of his kingdom coming and his will being done and how nothing will be able to thwart that. And it will come. It will come. You know, Billy Graham passed away this past week, right? I was, I was surprised at my own reaction when I heard that he had passed. I just, I just began to cry. You know why? Because I became a Christian as a senior in high school and immediately was thrust into a climate of hostility to the gospel and belittling of the gospel and Christianity just because other people didn't understand it. I didn't understand it before that, so I I probably gave a fair bit of that myself. And yet I saw this man somehow respected by everyone, speaking the message, the vision that I had been, became convinced of over a six month period of time of intense questioning truthfulness of the gospel and finally accepting it and seeing my life change. And in this environment of just hostility and belittling, I saw this man, I'm like, everyone respects him. And he's speaking the vision, he's speaking this message. Maybe, maybe someday I can be someone that just walks with the Lord and can be respected too, like he is. It was just so, it was so, such a profound impact he had on me. And you know, I, I was listening to a sermon from his driving home from the 515 service last night. And he was talking about the end of his life and talking about how he was suffering and he missed his dear wife and his body's breaking down. And he said, I, I look forward to heaven. <laughs> I can't do his accent worth anything. It's a beautiful accent. He says, I I look forward to this, and this is what is my hope right now, is one day my suffering being gone, my sadness being removed. We've got a family member right now in probably his last days in the hospital suffering with cancer. And you know what? Our family found ourselves speaking to him same vision. One day this will pass. It will happen. 
wait for it. But Habakkuk has a near-term vision, doesn't he, that God gave him. The Babylonians, those guys, the worst guys, they're coming. So how, how does God counsel Habakkuk? He doesn't leave him hanging. Listen to this. This is what he says. God says, Habakkuk, see, the enemy is puffed up. His desires are not upright. But the righteous person will live by his faithfulness. The righteous person will live by his faithfulness. God says, Habakkuk, I know the land's filled with violence. I know more is about to come. Leave that to me. I'll deal with that. But you, but you, walk with me. Walk with me. Hear my words. Take them into your heart. Walk with me in trust, in faith. And watch me be trustworthy and faithful to you. I will never leave you. This is how you will persevere, Habakkuk, amidst the worst of times, amidst the worst of suffering. Walk with me in faithfulness. The vision is that amidst treacherous times, God's people will persevere by their faithfulness. Will they be immune from all the suffering? No. Will God be with them? Will God be with you in your suffering? Yes. That's part of the vision. Is that an ancient vision? Is that a modern vision? Praise God, yes. It is a modern vision. This vision was spoken by God all through the pages of Scripture. God gives it in a very general way to Habakkuk, right? He just says, my presence, my glory is going to cover the whole earth like the waters cover the sea, Habakkuk. But other places in God's word, words that he speaks to God's people, he fleshes out more specifically how he will accomplish that vision. And if you fast forward the time from Habakkuk 600 BC or so to the time of Christ, and you see God making a major installment of how is he going to accomplish this vision? And you realize he comes himself, right? He pours himself into a human frame so that he can live a faithful life before God and he can take his faithful person and allow it to be stuck onto an evil tree and he will take the sin of the world upon him and he'll offer his faithfulness to his people that even in the best of days are not completely faithful. God knows that. He has to cover over our unfaithfulness. He does that on the cross. He goes into the grave. He rises, right? He he gives a commission to the church. He says, I want you to help other people hear my words. I want you to make disciples or learners of me and the church is born. And then you see God give new prophets, new spokespeople like the Apostle Paul. The words that Jesus uses to describe his mission, how the vision is being advanced by him. Listen to these in Luke's gospel. Right when he's setting out to do all of the things that come to your mind when you think of what he did in the gospels, he says, let's put this as a banner over everything you're going to watch me say or do. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Good news, God says. Rescue, redemption, salvation. That's what he's describing He's describing how God's people will persevere in a world mired in sin. And then you watch the New Testament writers pick up on these themes because it's the same vision. No matter what biblical writer you're listening to, the Apostle Paul says this, I'm not ashamed of this good news or the gospel because it's the power of God that brings rescue, redemption, salvation, to everyone who believes. 
first to the Jew, then the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Does that ring a bell? Paul's quoting Habakkuk. Isn't that interesting? Out of all the places in the whole Old Testament that the Apostle Paul could look back to, reach into and grab onto and pull it forward to paint the picture of the context of what God coming in the flesh has done for us and how God offers something to us and invites us to receive it. He says, Habakkuk spoke this vision. God spoke the vision to Habakkuk. Same vision, the righteous will live by faith. Or those who are with God declared just, not guilty. Those connected to God will walk with God by hearing his words, not sticking them in the freezer, but taking them into their heart. And Paul says, that's how God's people live. That's how they live. How did Habakkuk finish his conversation with God? I have to show you the end of the book. This is how it ends. Lord, I have heard of your fame. I stand in awe, in awe of your deeds, Lord. Repeat them in our day. In our time, make them known. In wrath, remember mercy. I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God, my Savior. Nothing has changed in Habakkuk's circumstance from the opening verses in chapter 1 to the closing verses in chapter 3. Nothing. So how has he evolved to this point? It's the vision. It's the words God spoke to him. The vision of God's kingdom. It humbles and strengthens Habakkuk all at the same time. It, it drives him to his knees and yet it fortifies him with new strength. It humbles and strengthens Habakkuk to the point where adversity and doubt are now commingled with joy. He still has adversity. He still has doubt. But now, because of hearing God's words to him and taking them into his heart, he now also has joy. <laughs> it's a paradox. The world looks at this and says, how can that be? Schizophrenia. God says, no. <laughs> Healthiness. <laughs> adversity, doubt, questions, sorrow, lamentation, and joy. Joy at the presence of the Lord, joy in the faithfulness of the Lord, of his provision for you, all enmeshed together for a while until the glory of the Lord covers the earth as the waters cover the sea, which is the vision that God says it will happen. Wait for it. Hope in it. Habakkuk opened his conversation with God by saying, God, you don't save. <laughs> I'm asking you to save, and you don't save. But God says, yes, I do. <laughs> yes, I do, Habakkuk. I'm saving you right now. <laughs> Salvation in this life, in this time, does not mean being devoid of suffering or questioning or sorrow. Habakkuk, one day it will look like that, it doesn't look like that right now. So walk with me and let me walk with you. We don't know much about the person of Habakkuk. We don't know where he came from. We don't know about his family. We do know about his name. Many times God gives prophets names to anticipate the message that they will give. Do you know what Habakkuk's name means? To embrace to embrace. And so this prophet, in all of his adversity and all his doubts, he lived his namesake. He said, God, I'm going to stand here and I'm going to embrace what you say to me. I know you have adversity. 
I have adversity. I know you suffer. I do as well. God's word to us today is the same word it was to Habakkuk. My kingdom is coming. My will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Until, until that day comes, walk with me, walk in faithfulness to me, and ask me to do in your day my acts of mercy for you and those around you. Let's pray. I told you this little prophet would have a big message for you. It's a modern message. It's a gracious message. Aren't you glad that God is not a God that looks at you and says, gosh, why can't you get over this? Or how long are you going to just wallow? He's a God of compassion. He's a God of mercy. And he's a God who loves you so that he will chase you down so that he can be with you. Bring your heart to him this morning. Bring your adversity. Let him speak his words of vision for his kingdom and for you into your life, into your heart. together with us this morning and I don't know about you what you've gone through this past week or month or so maybe you've been on a high point a low point but the one thing that's always constant that we can rely on is that faithfulness of God so let's lift this up this morning and let him know that we're grateful for that right? Father of kindness you have poured out grace brought me out of darkness
think of what those are, but the one thing that for sure that we can rely on is God and his promises, and we can stand on those this morning. So let's sing this next part out, right? I will rest in your promises. Amen. Our confidence is in him. Let's depart this morning by praying this over one another, praying this to God, the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray, where we directly ask him, God, we want now in our day, we want your kingdom to come now. We want your will to be done now. Yeah, we know it will be done fully later. God, we want a piece of that now. And you know, when we pray that, God does that. He just makes little enclaves of blessing and abundance in our world, in our town. So let's ask him to do that. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Amen. So glad you came today. Have a great rest of the weekend.